to go into beans in the kitchen. Hey, so listen, 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 look, and listen. Uh, these are the flyers that we have been passing out for the Moving On Up series. If you want to help us pass some of those out, you can get some of those from the Connect Center. I would say take about 10 of them. Just pass them out, man. People are dealing with issues, and we want to be the voice of reason in a dark world. We want to be the voice in the wilderness that's calling out and uh, helping people to get aligned with what God is doing in this place. Are you guys ready for a good word? Let's take it up. Let's move on up a little bit higher. You guys ready for a good word? Yeah, 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 yeah. God has given me this series, and man, I get excited. It's about Thursday, and I'm like, man, is Sunday here yet? And sometimes I just want to go on Facebook or go on Instagram Live and just preach it, but I, he's saying, wait, 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 just wait. And so this morning, I am overflowing with, with wisdom, with knowledge, with God's grace, and I can't wait to share it with you this morning. If we can stand up. Uh, I did this a little bit differently. I did put a scripture on here, but I want to go to the Psalms 139, uh, verse 13 through 17. It's the last slide I think that you guys prepared. Uh, Psalms 139, verse 13 through 17. Uh, I, I want to give you this, and if you have your, your packet, everybody has their, their, their worksheet. If you have that, the scripture should be on there. I'm going to read that scripture before I lead off because this is where I want us to wind up. This is where I want us to end at the table is knowing why we were created for such a time as this. And the, the scripture reads like this. It says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How precious to me are the things that you think about me, God. How vast is the sum of them. Father, I pray, Lord, that today we understand who you created us to be. We understand how powerful we are. We understand, Lord, that we lack nothing, Father, that we have security in our insecurities, Father. We know that if you didn't give it to us, we don't need it, Father, because you divinely gifted us, crafted us, formed us, knit us together in our mother's womb. God, before we even had these issues and thoughts before us, God, you thought well of us. And so this morning, I ask, Lord, that we can take off the voices of the world. We can take off the voices of negativity. We can take off the voices of, of, of depression and put on the helmet of salvation knowing that we are divinely, fearfully, and wonderfully made in the image of God. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you can have a seat this morning. I thank you guys so much for coming along this journey. Uh, as we continue this, this, this moving on up series. This is week two at the table. Last week we talked about overcoming anxiety and we, we talked about that thing. We talked about that thing. Praise God. We got our fire. Hopefully it's not a real fire, but we'll pray that they take care of that uh, in the process. With these fire alarms, this is a part of my sermon now. <laughs> alarms come to alert us that a season has changed, a, uh, something has happened in the building. And so we know that this table right here represents that something has changed about you. When we talk about moving from the kitty table, we, we talk about moving from the eye zone and moving into the red zone. For football players, that means that you're getting close to the score. And so as we think about and hear these, these sirens going off, we know that God is alerting us that something is about to change. Something is, is happening. You need to be on alert. It's time for you to move. It's time for you to get out. It's time for you to move from one table to the next because God is alerting us that at the big table, he's got big plans for you. And at the table, it's time for us to sit down and be able to eat amongst kings and queens. Anxiety was sitting there last week. Last week, anxiety told us 
What if this happens? What if my kids don't make it to college? What if they don't they get hurt? Or what if I leave them and, and they're at their father's house and they don't they don't work on it? What if this happens or that happens? What if, what if, what if, what if? But we learn that anxiety is just a roaring lion. Roar! But his power is nothing for God's power. This week, insecurities join us at the table. Now, there are two types of insecurities that I want to talk about this week. There are global insecurities, and there are individual insecurities. There's global things that we deal with on a big scale, and then there's other things that we deal with that are not so big, but it's how we feel in certain situations, situational insecurities, global insecurities and situational insecurities. How many of y'all have uh, voices in your head uh, that talk to you in certain ways? All of us. All of us have voices. All of our voices influence who we are or what we do or what our future looks like. The Bible says it this way. It says the voice we respond to determines the future we experience. The voice that we respond to determines the future that we experience. The voices in our head come from the people that speak into our lives when we're at the kitty table. So it comes from family, comes from friends, comes from teachers, comes from coaches, comes from pastors, comes from neighborhood uh, folks in the neighborhood, comes from cousins, co-workers, uncles, bosses, aunts, supervisors, presidents, news media, radio personnel. All of these voices come into our head and they influence us for what we're going to do next. Most of the time, these voices are competing in our minds. So Sunday, uh, uh, Friday night, there was uh, a football game. Hightower played there, their last football game of the season. And uh, they were playing hard. They, they, they fought. They fought. But to no avail, they lost the game. And at the end of the game, uh, some of the parents were upset with some of the, the coaching calls. And one of the parents proceeded out of the stands to come and to talk to the coach, is what he said at first. And so when I, when I got to him, I said, hey, man, what's going on? Because I, I met him this week. And he said, I'm coming to talk to the coach. And I was like, hey, well, now is not the time to do it. I said, what are you going to talk to him about? He said, I'm about to beat his. And so here I am, the pastor of the community. And here is this guy that's ready to beat up the coach because of the play calling because he thinks that he ended his son's career. And so as this man is pushing through me, I'm, I'm a pretty strong guy. And so I was holding him back, and I was like, come on, man. We got to be a better role model, man. You're, you're, you're a father to one of the kids. He's watching you. These, these things are happening. You got you to gotta do better about this, man. You can't, you can't allow this thing to overcome you. Everybody's watching you, and he's continuing to push me. And, and, and I'm moving in him, and, and I'm, in, I'm getting to the point where I'm about to go old school. But in my mind... All I hear is you're the pastor for the community. You're the pastor for the community. You're the pastor for the community. This was the voice that I was listening to. This influenced me to not body slam them, but to say, hey, man, come on. Those voices in our heads can either cause us detriment or they'll be life-giving. Here the whole stadium is looking at what will happen. What will you do, Pastor Carlos? How will you handle this? How will you do it? That's the same way that everybody's looking at you. Children are looking at their fathers. Children are looking at their mothers. We have, have, have parents looking at their neighbors. How will they respond to the things in this world, to the insecurities that come about and talk to us in our minds? There's a scripture that I want to talk about this morning, and it's in the book of Exodus. If you can turn your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 3. Exodus, chapter 3. Verse 10 through 14. Can somebody uh, call Mr. Bowman? He's calling me, um, but I can't answer the phone. He is the uh, custodian here. If we can find him some kind of way. Okay. Okay, thank you. Exodus chapter 3, 10 through 14. Uh, Moses, anybody ever heard of a guy named Moses? Moses, anybody ever heard of Moses? Moses, Moses, Moses was 
a, a gentleman uh, that we know him to be the guy that went to Pharaoh. And what's the famous thing that he told Pharaoh? Let my people go. And so we, 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 fame, we fame him for that, and we, we, we hold him as a pillar. Uh, we look at him as the, the person that led the Israelites, the Hebrew uh, Israelites, or the, Hebrew, uh, the Israelites out of, of darkness and into a, a different place. But Moses struggled with insecurities. Moses struggled with his assignment. So if we look at, at Exodus uh, chapter 3, verses 10 through 14, this is what the Bible says. Uh, God is, is, is talking to, to Moses, and he's giving him direction of what he's going to do. Moses had married some of Jethro's daughters, and he had left Egypt where he was um, pulled away from. So let me just give you a little bit about, about uh, uh, Moses. Moses was born during the, the time period where they were killing Hebrew boys. At his birth, when he was born, hey, praise God. Y'all give God a hand clap of praise. That was distracting the heck out of me. I was like, God, how long? How much longer, Father? You said don't grow weary and doing good, but how much longer are we going to have to endure this? Praise God. All right, now let's get into this thing now. I got my focus back. We, we, we see through the storm. So Moses, he, they're killing the babies. They said, go and kill every, every male that's born. Moses just happened to be born during the time period where they were killing off the males. Moses is born. Uh, his, his, his mom takes care of him for a little bit. She hides out. And then after a while, she puts him in a basket and she floats him down uh, the river, hoping that somebody from Pharaoh's house would gather him and save his life. This is a word for people that may have be, that, that, that may be adopted, that may have, have been an orphan. Sometimes one of the greatest things that our parents can do is give us up. Sometimes. Now, if you have your kids and you think, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those that may have been given up. Sometimes that's the best thing that our parents can do is to put us in a position to give us life because if Moses would have been killed and slaughtered like the Pharaoh wanted him to be, this thing would have never come into fruition. And so I, I believe more in adoption than I mean I believe in abortion. You understand what I'm saying? I believe more in adoption than I believe in abortion. Because I believe that if, if you can get a child adopted, they have a fighting chance. But if you kill a child before he even sees the world, you rip away the things that could have been brought into this earth. And so I praise God for those of you that are here today that that made the decision to have your child and preach that, teach that to the people in your community. Have the child. Man, adoption, people are, are around the world are looking to have children. Now, don't do this on purpose, but if something happens and that's an option from the pulpit, it's better to, to adopt than it is to abort. Now, the best thing to do is to keep your kids in and raise them. But if you're not in a position to do that, that's fool. That's not a part of my sermon, but... PSA, that, that's you got that. So Moses is, is floating down the river. Uh, Pharaoh's, uh, somebody in Pharaoh's house sees him, and, and they go and they get the child. And they raise the child in Egypt. Here this man is. He's a, a Hebrew man. He's now uh, with, living with the Pharaoh, and he's raised under the Pharaoh's hand. Moses gets older, and he walks away from the, uh, the house of Pharaoh, and he sees an Egyptian man beating up somebody from his blood type. Moses takes it upon himself and he kills the Egyptian in lieu of saving his kinsmen. The next day he goes out and he sees two of his brothers out there fighting and he goes to the man and, and, and he pushes them and they, and they say, well, well, who gave you the authority to be Lord over us? Who told you to, to be Lord over us? He said, are you planning on killing me like you did the Egyptian on yesterday? And so Moses, with all the fear in his body, he said, man, they found out about me because he had killed the guy before, put him in the sand. He didn't want anybody to see him. And so now people know about what's going on, and now Moses flees. Now let me add, tell you something about it. So back in the day, if you grew up under your father's household, when he died, guess what you got? You got land. You got, uh, we got everything that the father left behind. You got it all. Here Moses leaves and he goes to a foreign land where he has nothing. So he's not only an orphan, he's a murderer. And now he marries a woman and he's living with his wife's daddy. Y'all see the picture? Orphan, murderer, 
and he doesn't even have his own house. Moses is out working, and, and this big burning bush, it, it, it burns, and Moses is like, man, this bush has been burning for a long time, and he goes over to see it, and as he gets to the bush, God speaks from within the bush, and he says, Moses, take off your sandals because you're standing on holy ground. God then begins to speak to Moses about who God is. Let's look at what the scripture says. He says, so now go. I am sending you. This is Exodus 3, 10 through 14. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people to the Israelites out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you and this will be the sign to you that if that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they asked me, what is his name? He says, then you shall tell them, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me. I am is the person that I want to talk about tonight. Can you say, say, I am. I am who sent me. The enemy, when he's dealing with your insecurities, many of you have insecurities, whether you, you believe that you're not good enough or you're not smart enough, it's pretty much, I am never blank enough. You put it in there yourself. One of the things that I struggle with, and I'll be transparent, is I never think that I am smart enough. I'm always going into industries and places with much older people and people that, that, that know more about certain things than I do. And, and immediately insecurities overwhelm me and I believe that I am not good enough. What is it for you? I, I talk about the story when I uh, finished playing football and, and I, I told God that I was going to serve him and I went off to Emory University and it's a predominant um, white institution and it was a prestigious institution and they called it the Harvard of the South and here I come off of the football field just ready to knock somebody's head off and now I have to transition into the classroom and sitting in the classroom with the conversations that happened around me I felt inferior because I didn't feel like I was good enough. Now, I had made a promise to God that I wasn't going to go to the NFL if I got accepted to this school. God opened the door for me to get accepted, and here I am in the place that God accepted me to go to, and I feel like I don't belong there. Anybody ever felt like that? That I do not belong. I, you, you may go to certain houses, and, and you feel uncomfortable. You want to get away from yourself because you feel like, I don't belong. But God is saying, I position you here. This is the table. This is the seat at the table that I, I ushered for you. You please sit because it's for you. Because it's not about how you feel about yourself. It's about how I created you to be. And so when we ask ourselves, what, what, what are these insecurities? So the definition for insecurities is having a lack of confidence. Having a lack of confidence. Having a lack of security, insecurity, I lack security. The other thing is having feelings of anxiety. He's already at the table. And number four is an uncertainty about myself. When the enemy attacks you, he brings about your past because if you can listen to your past, then he can influence you to stop you from moving into your future. God says that I have given, I have hope and a future for you, but if I can eliminate the hope, then there's no future. There's no future for your kids. There's no future for your life. There's no future for your family. There's no future for your work ethic. There's no future for your career. There's no future for you. If I can stop you with anxiety and insecurity, I can stop you from moving forward. And so how does the world help with this, with the global insecurities? That's, that's what we say on television. It's all about money and appearances. Kanye West, the great author and uh, philosopher of our time, help us, God. He said some of the people that are the, the prettiest people have the lowest self-esteem. Do you know that supermodels have the lowest self-esteem on this planet? 
And the reason because, the reason for that is because they always compare themselves to pretty people. So every day they wake up saying, oh my gosh, my eyebrows are off. Oh my gosh, my, my face is getting fat. Oh my gosh, my, my chin is too small. Oh my gosh, this is happening. Oh my gosh, this is happening. And they never, they're some of the beautifulest people. You can look at them and say, man, I wish I was like them, but they don't feel it in themselves. How many of y'all know, remember the pretty girl in school that winded up with the dude and you was like, how in the world did that happen? Or the, the most handsome guy, and you, you date them, and then you say, man, you got, you got issues. To the point where you, you want to stop dating pretty girls because they got issues. And handsome guys. Because they look like they have a package, but they are insecure. So global insecurities, how much money do you make? Well, I don't make enough, so I don't want to go hang out with the guys because they all make more than me. Or, or you know what, man, I, my, my, my hair is receding, so I can't, I can't be who I am. And so we wake up and we look in the mirror, and all of a sudden, insecurities overwhelm us. So much to the point where we don't want to go out and do what God has called us to do because we're insecure. Moses is having a situational insecure moment in the presence of God. God has a life's task for Moses, but Moses has a speech impediment and low self-esteem on top of being an orphan, on top of being a murderer, and on top of not having any land. He doesn't feel like he has anything to provide for the world, but God chose him. So I know what you're saying. Well, Pastor, what are you? I'm saying that I don't care what your past looks like. I know that if God chose you, he chose you. Because anytime there is a faith walk that you have to venture into territory that you have not been in, as you sit at the table, you have to know that there is going to be attack on your purpose for what you do. So Moses is under attack at God's table, but God shows Moses how to deal with his insecurities. Are y'all ready to go on this journey? Are you ready to go on this journey? Insecurities do this. Insecurities make you push the people that you need in your life away. Insecurities make you act out in ways that are not healthy for you. Insecurities have you play dress up and do things that you shouldn't have done or wouldn't have done on any other circumstance. I remember when I went to this school so many years ago, I used to wear a do-rag on my head. Anybody remember those days? You wake up and you walk outside. We had different colored do-rags. And my father would always tell me, son, take that do-rag off when you're around me. And I was like, man, dad, what's wrong, man? We cool. This is what we do. And now looking back with the eyes of my father and I see kids with do-rag, I'm like, man, why that boy got his do-rag on his head? Because in the moment, I was trying to fit in a context. Some of y'all have conversations that you really wouldn't have, but based upon the people that you're around, you talk about those things. Some of y'all have cussing problems because you curse to get along with other folks. Some of you guys dress a certain way because that's what people are doing. And if somebody asks you, you would use this excuse. Well, this is what I feel comfortable in putting on. Not knowing that you're a clone of other people around you, that you are not being set apart, but you're only doing what everybody else is doing. And it starts when we're a child sitting at the table because we want to belong in a place where God has told us to set out from. But our insecurities will make us think and do things that we wouldn't normally do. Two ways that you'll know somebody's insecure. Now, don't be offended if you fit in any of these categories. Just know that God made this sermon for you. People that are very shy and timid have insecurities. I apologize. And on the other spectrum, those of you that are very aggressive have insecurities. The shy person doesn't want anybody to see that they're not that smart or that they're not that good looking or they don't have it all upstairs or that they lack something. And the aggressive person is protecting their insecurities because if they believe that they can roar louder, then you won't get close enough to see what's going on with them. So the people at your jobs, the people at your schools, the people where you work, if you see these things, they're all protecting something. But God has already spoken into their life and said who they are, but they just don't know it yet. Until things are revealed in this season. There are three voices that Moses is hearing at this burning bush. The first voice is God's voice. The second voice is the insecurities. 
And the third voice is Moses's. When we go and look at this, this particular verse where it says, um, where, where Moses is talking about who, who, who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? This is what insecurities and, and Satan will do to stop you. So this is what Satan will do. He will say, you're not good enough, right? But then in turn, you will vocalize his words and say, I'm not good enough. It's so bad that he will project his accomplishments and make you own the feeling. So he'll look at the table and say, yeah, you're not ready yet. You're not good enough. And then when you speak, you say, I'm not ready yet. I'm not good enough. He'll say, you're not chosen. You'll say, I'm not chosen. See, what happens, and God showed me this as I was getting ready for this. At this small table, my daughter sits at this table, and she wants to do things that she's not ready to do yet. My daughter wants to drive. She's four years old, and she wants to drive a car. Daddy, I want to drive. No, daughter, you, you can't even touch the pedals. She wants to pour her own milk. Now, she is this tall, and the gallon is half her size, but she wants to pour the milk at the table. And I'm like, no, baby, you're not, you're not big enough. You're not strong enough for that yet. She wants to go outside and play by herself. Babe, you're not big enough to do that. She wants to, 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 to go to school by herself. She wants to do all of these things. And all I continue to tell her is, you're not ready for that yet. Now, that works at this table because those limitations are set so that she doesn't hurt herself. But what happens when the child grows up and he sits at the table and he sits, here's the same thing. I got a position for you. Well, I'm not ready for that yet. I got something great for you. Well, I'm not tall enough for that yet. I want you to go and do something. Well, I'm not smart enough to do that yet. Because the transition and transfer of limitations have now grown up with you, and now you sit at the big table thinking that you're not ready what God has already positioned you for. So what voices have you heard in your head that you didn't put into perspective? So Moses is, is, is standing in front of this burning bush. Insecurities are hitting his mind, and he's telling him, I'm not good enough. God, you don't know my past. You know who I am, but, 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 but I'm a murderer. I'm an orphan. I don't have a house for myself, and I can't speak that well. God, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm no good for this position. Anybody ever feel like I'm not? I'm not, 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 I'm not. And then God says, I am. So the first question Moses asks God, who am I? See, when God was talking about who he was, he says, when he came on the onset, if we go back to Exodus chapter 3, and we look at the verses before 10 uh, through 14, Jesus, uh, God comes down and he talks to Moses and he tells Moses who he is. Now, as Moses is going on, as God is going on to Moses and talking to him about who he is, he then asks God, well, that's great about you, but who am I? So the Lord comes to him and he says, Moses, Moses, I am the God of your father. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this time, Moses hid his face because he was in awe of who God was. And then after God talks about who he is, then Moses asks, who am I? The voices God uses tells Moses, I want you to go back to your past and free my people. I want you to go back, hear me in first person, I want you to go back to your past and free my people. This is a literary, literal statement, but I want you to use it and own it. I'm talking to you now. If you're looking at me, I'm talking to you. I want you to go back to your past and free my people. Many of you have come out of many, 
many different situations, many different circumstances. Uh, you've come out of abuse. Some of y'all have been sexually molested. Some of y'all have been divorced. Some of y'all have been thrown away. Some of you have been orphaned. Some of you have had, had problems with insecurity. Some of you have come from broken backgrounds. Some of you come from the hood. Some of you come up from no good. You went from not having a father or no mother, and now you're living. And God is saying, I want you to go back and free my people. But the thing that stops us from going back is thinking that we haven't come far enough that they won't listen to us. Moses' voice, who am I? God is speaking to Moses because he's chosen Moses to accomplish the impossible task through him. And so, Satan cause plays of insecurities to stop you from going to the field. Because Satan says you're not good enough, but God, the good father, says, I created you and knitted you in the womb. The second question that some of us ask when God gives us a task is, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't believe you? What if they don't believe that you are who you say you are? God says this. Moses says, I'm not able to speak eloquently enough. God says, well, who created your mouth? Moses says, well, 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 well I'm not smart enough. He says, well, who created your brain? Moses says, well, my, my financial situation is not where I think it should be. And God says, well, who created the finances? Moses has doubt in himself, but faith in God. How many of us, you, you believe God is big enough to do anything? You just don't believe it transferred to you. God's given you the ability to do anything. You believe God. God, you're awesome. I saw, I heard about you part of the Red Sea. I saw how you came up and, and gave provision to these people. But then when it's time for you to do something, you're like, God, I ain't that good. You know that it is an insult to the manufacturer when you talk about the product. Catch that. Catch that. Catch that. Catch that. When you doubt the product, you insult the manufacturer. There is no greater insult in life than to speak negatively about the one who created you. So there's a scripture in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. I never looked at this scripture like this before until I was working on this sermon. It says this. It says, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold any guiltless who will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Pretty much, you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. Now, I used to think that that meant that you shouldn't curse, like you shouldn't say God, or you shouldn't say, uh, uh, oh my God, you shouldn't do any of that stuff. But then when I was reading this, when God says that you shouldn't use my name in vain, that means that when you become a Christian and he puts his name on you, then anything that goes against his name is misuse of his name. So my wife, she, she, she was a Gaines before we got married. And so God blessed her and, and brought me to her life so that she could become a Jones. So she gained a Jones last name. Now when she put on the name Jones, now she wears what Jones means. And so if Jones means great athlete or intelligent person or nice looking young man or strapping young speaker or great pastor or great preacher, whatever that name means, she then wears the name. So if she thinks anything that is contrary to that name, then she is using my name in. So when you put on Christ's kingdom on yourself, when you accept the hand of salvation, when you say I'm washed and bought in the blood, and you do anything that's against what God is saying, you are using his name in vain. God says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. If you say anything against that, you are using his name in vain. Never from this day forth should you say that I am not anything because God created you to be everything. Now this is what I do know that God did. God created you without certain things on purpose. You hear me? On 
purpose he did that. Because it's not until you hook up with God that you become the full picture that he gave you. He created you with insufficiencies so that when you match up with him, he could be your everything. You can't speak good on your own, but when God speaks through you, everything is fluid. He wants to use the things that you're not secure in to build up the things that people want to see. God has made you like that on purpose so that he can get the glory for your story and not you. It's not about you. It's for the glory of God. And so you're insecure. That's the alarm going off saying, you need God in this place. You need God in your speech. You need God in your marriage. You need God in your self-esteem. You need God in your friendship circles. You need God on your job. Wherever you lack, God has given you more. I had the football team recite this, and, and he gave it to me on the spot. If God didn't give it to you, you don't need it. If God didn't give it to you, you don't need it to accomplish what God is doing in your life. If God didn't give it to you, you don't need it. Some of y'all looking for a husband, looking for a wife. If you don't have it right now, you don't need it to accomplish what God has given you in this season. So do your best with what God has given you so that you can walk into your next season. If God didn't give you the money right now, guess what? You don't need it. Forget what the world tells you you need to be successful or how you're supposed to dress or what kind of uh, house you're supposed to live in or what the American dream looks like. If God didn't give it to you now, you don't need it to accomplish why he made you. So never again shall we take the Lord's name in vain. It's not what your speech is what you do with what God has given you. Moses Moses is focused more on his deficiencies than his securities with God. I want you to ask yourself as you look. I want you to touch yourself, pinch yourself. And I want you to ask God, God, did you make a mistake with me? Now, you all heard the same voice. What did he say? 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 So if God didn't make a mistake, then why are we at the big table thinking that we're at the little table? Take this statement to the bank. God doesn't make trash. God doesn't make extra parts and pieces that, that fall off to the wayside. Everything that God has made, he has made you fearfully and wonderfully. And this is the third statement that we use when we were insecure. Moses uses this, God, uh, use somebody else. Feel like, you know, we can just pass the plate. You know what, God, not this one. This is a little bit too big for me. Or, or no, I'm not ready for that. Or, or no, I'm not ready. You know what, this is what happens. We get into a marriage, right? And then it's not working out like we thought it was going to work out. And then we say, God, I wasn't ready. You know what that is? That's. That's those little things at the little table coming out at the big table. God is saying that I gave you the option of free will to, to choose a bride, and you, you married this person under me. And so it's not that you need to walk away from the marriage or from the table. It's that you need to sit at the table and learn of me. You need to have more of me. You think that you can do this thing on your own, but you can't because I didn't design it like that. He said a three-strand cord was not easily broken, but a two one can be broken easily. So you and your wife trying to work it out, you need more than just you two to work it out. You got to have God's leadership. And that's just not saying, oh, we're going to pray together. No, you need to get some word in your marriage. And so that's why it's, it's important for us to continue to meet as saints because people around us reach out to us and they make us better and they make us bigger. And so that's why we have I groups for marriage. That's why we have I groups for singles. That's why we have I groups for young professionals because the more that we have these things, the better that you can grow so that those little things at the little table won't then define your destiny. Because God's power and his great is anointing you to do something greater. And so here's how we combat these things. Uh, although, Moses, you're scared, I, I, I'm still going to use this. Uh, uh, our, our biggest fear is that we doubt God, but we, we don't doubt God. We doubt ourselves. So here's four ways to overcome insecurities. You ready? Four things that we can do as we sit at the big table. The first thing that we must do 
is we have to accept forgiveness for the things that we've we done in our past. I was watching Iyana save my life or whatever it is, fix my life. And she had on there three guys that were from uh, prison. And, and she did a phenomenal job of just kind of showing these guys the broken foundation that they grew up with before they made the decision to kill somebody or, 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 or they murdered somebody. And one of the things that they had not done is they did not admit that they killed somebody. They always talked about how it was somebody else's fault why they did what they did. And she said something so crucial. She said, if the soul does not acknowledge, it will always be in contention with itself. And I said, man, it's powerful. If you don't acknowledge who you are, what you've done, or that you got big ears, big lips, and a, and a big nose, if you don't accept that and acknowledge it, you're going to always be running away from it. If you don't acknowledge how God created you, if you don't acknowledge your past, then it's going to be very hard for you to move into your future because you don't accept what God has made. And so whether you have abuse somebody in your past, you have made bad decisions, whether you gone off course or whether you picked up an addiction early at the kitty table or whether you walked into, into some things that you shouldn't have walked into, you must be able to ask and accept forgiveness. God, forgive me. The second thing that we have to do is we have to listen to God's voice. Remember, at the table, it's, it's God's table, and we're in God's house, and so we have to listen to God's voice louder than any other voices that we hear at the table. The third thing that we must believe is know that the result is ultimately greatness because he created us to be great, because we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And then the fourth thing that we must do is remember who pulled out the chair for us at the table. God, in Exodus 3.13, he gives us the antidote to Moses after he says, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then we shall tell them, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. God is pretty much saying that I am everything that they're looking for. He says, who sent me? He says, I am sent me. What God did to Moses was so powerful because he didn't say he sent me. He said, I sent me. I am sent me. And so when they say, well, who sent you? You can say, I, 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 I am sent me. So God is the God of the gaps. So he says, I am the God of your current situation. I am the God that fills in all of your insecurities. I am the God, not just the, your grandmother's God, but I am your God. So wherever it is that you feel like there is a lack, guess what? I am is filled that thing in. So when you, you get frustrated, when you get upset, when you feel like God isn't using you enough and you don't feel like you are powerful enough, all you have to say is I am. Say I am. I am love. I am great. I am smart enough. I'm not fearful. I am joyful. I am courageous. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am the God. Even when you feel enslaved, I am. I can't battle this addiction. God is saying, I am. I can't stay in this marriage. He's saying, I am. God, I can't live this life single anymore. He says, I am. Everything that you feel like you're not, he is. So that means that you lack nothing in your life. Many of us are, are searching and looking under rocks and, and doing things that we wouldn't normally do. And God says, I already put that in you. So you are good enough. The great I am created you. There's a saying that you can't control the birds from flying around your head, but you can stop him from building a nest. Who's built a nest in your mind this morning? What thoughts, what thoughts have built nests in your mind? And, and you can't move past what God has, has, has told you to do because you're thinking about, I wish I was tall, I wish it was a, Fall, I wish I, I would call her if I, if I had. I will go talk to her, but I'm not. I will go apply for that job, but I'm not qualified. I would go up there and talk to him, but I'm, I'm, I'm not. Fear, 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 fear stops us from leaving the kitty table and sitting with the big boys at the table. I want to get involved with church, but I'm not. 
God, I'm going I'm to I'm start being faithful to you when I stop cussing, when I stop drinking, when I, when I stop. It's, it's all of it is, is fear. He's getting those voices in your head to stop you from making progression. But God is saying, I am the God right now. That if you put my vest on and put my jersey on, you already have made the team. So the kids are told most of the time that when they try to venture into territory that they're not ready for it. But at the big table, we have to remember who God has said that we are. So today I want you to put your kitty thoughts away. Are you the right person for the position? After I say these things, I want you to say, I am. Can you help me with that? Are you great enough to change your community? Can you lead the next generation? Are you good enough to be great? Are you tall enough to reach your dreams? Are you a good person? Are you a faithful person? Are you consistent? Are you fearfully and wonderfully made? Now I want you to repeat this when we say I can. Can you do all things through Christ who strengthens you? Can you Make it through the darkest moments of your life. Can you overcome depression? Can you overcome insecurities? They told you that you couldn't because you wasn't ready. But all of us have been hand-selected by God. What God did was he went over to the kitty table and he said, Carlos, it's time for you to go back and rescue my people. At this table is broken homes and broken families. At this table are people that don't care about God. At this table, there are people that don't care about uh, Christianity or God or religion. At this table, there are people that wish that you weren't even around. At this table, there is brokenness and insecurities. At this table, there are things that, that, that don't want you to be who you are. At this table, they don't want you to invite people to, to come and be a part of what you have going on. At this table, these are people that will rather you just move out and let them live their life. At this table are lawless people, people that have no no reverence for God or, or for mankind and he said at this table I want you to go get my people and bring them to another level and I'm sitting at the table and what I see is a bunch of people that don't even want to be here and God is saying I put you at this table because there's something that I want to do in you and you have to be willing to sit here knowing that I have prepared this table for you now I don't know what your table is I don't know if your table is stepping it up in the school system. I don't know if it's your table is stepping it up in the boardroom or, or being the president or being the CEO or being the best uh, car washer or the best janitor or the best uh, plant worker. I don't know what your table looks like, but I know that if God put you at the table, it's work to be done at the table. And so when he sits you at the table, you better get comfortable because God is saying that I'm getting ready to do something in and through you. When we sit at the table, our job now is to turn our back on childish things. Our job now is to know that I'm smart enough, I'm gifted enough, I'm friendly enough, I'm, I'm light enough, I'm dark enough, I'm wealthy enough, I'm, I'm skinny enough, I, I, I'm capable enough, I'm Christian enough, I'm supported enough, I'm strong enough, I've been around long enough, I'm experienced enough, I'm different enough to sit at the table. 
we can say that I am that I am. Whatever I lack now, I am has sent me to the table. How did you get that position? I am sent me. How did you get at the table? I am brought me here. How did you even get into the boardroom? I am sent me here. How did you get married? I am sent me here. How did you graduate? I am sent me here. How did you get into this neighborhood? I am sent me here. How did you get the GPA? I am sent me here. Insecurities can't hold me back. You can't talk to me like that because I am. He gave me a right to stand here and I'm not leaving just because you want me to leave. Who do you think you are that you can tell me that my God who gave you a seat at my table, you sit at my table, you at my table, you better leave my table because God said he will prepare a presence in the, in the present, a prepared table in the presence of my enemies. Most of us have been fighting to stay at the table. Your fights look like this. I can't do it. I'm not good enough. I'm, I'm not able. I'm not smart enough. God is saying, turn your back on that table. Look at your insecurities and look at anxiety, knowing that that's just a roaring lion, knowing that this just wants to stop you from getting into the end zone. But I declare that I have given you life and given you life more abundantly. I have given you everything even before you were born. I knew you was going to be broke and not have enough money to pay rent, but I am. I knew that your marriage would be on the rocks, but I am. I knew that you wouldn't have securities to go apply for that job, but I am. For I created you in my innermost. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, God. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. Somebody ought to get excited. This is talking to you. All the days ordained for me were written in the book before you were even born. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. You're at the table. Say, I'm at the table. Say, I'm at the table. Say, I'm getting ready to eat. You, hey, I, if you're hungry and something comes to pull you away from you, you're like, hey, hey, that's going to have to wait till later. You need to put your I'm not on hold right now. In this season, your eye, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to take you to the place that God is bringing you to. But we first have to accept the forgiveness of God. Humble ourselves and write down your weaknesses. Hey, hey, your weaknesses are your weaknesses. Own them. Sometimes when I get excited, I start stuttering. Own it. Own it. Own it. Own it, own it, own it, own it. If you're not consistent, own it. If you're not administratively gifted, own it. If you're not good enough, it's a, hey, say, you know what? I'm not, but I am. I'm not, but I am. Because only when you own it, God can start to move in your life. This morning, this message only works if you have Jesus Christ in your life. Only when you accept Jesus Christ will you have the power to move from the kiddie table to the big table and say that I am. Because you can't say that I am if you don't have I am in you. And so the question I ask you, are you tired of sitting at the kitty table? Is there anybody in here that said I'm sick and tired of saying that I can't, that I'm not, that I'm not good enough, that I'm not great enough, but I know that today that I am, and I'm ready to make a bold statement for everybody and say I should be at the table. This time and this season right now, and this moment, he says, don't grow weary in doing good for in due season you shall reap a harvest. It's harvest time now. So if you know that God formed you before you were born and God is everything that you lack, if you know that you can take confidence that I am is responsible for your success, If you need to be informed and remember why you are at the table with purpose, then you must first give your life to Christ. And so this is a call for anybody that has never accepted Jesus Christ. You are not, but today that I am.